Welcome to this webinar and thank you so much for your interest in evaluating the outcomes of training. So my name's Claire Feeney and I'm a strategic environmental trainer. What that means is I help environmental experts develop, deliver and evaluate the brilliant training that only they can do. Now I've worked in the environmental area all of my professional life, which is extremely long. And um, I've also been a member of the New Zealand Association of Training and Development for about 15 years. And why that's relevant is it means I've been able to learn and indeed burgle the tools from the best professional trainers all around the world. And one of those tools is how to measure how cost effective your training is. So professional trainers do that using well-established business methods that most of you will already know about measuring ROI, the return on investment. And in this particular case, it's being applied to training and that is exactly what we will be doing today. Now, I know the pandemic has seen a lot of companies slash their training budgets. I've heard people say that because they're struggling to find work until the big shovel ready projects and the regional development projects pipeline starts flowing. That is a real issue. And the government and the construction sector have been working so hard to try and keep firms in business and staff on board. But the industry is still hurting. But when the work does come in, there's going to be a lot of it. And there's going to be a lot of new staff who need training, technical training, environmental training, health and safety training, you name it. So learning now how to measure and monetize the results of that training is probably the absolute best use of your time right now. So is this you? You're telling your manager how absolutely and utterly brilliant your environmental training is and he's going, show me the money. If it is, you're in the right place. So here's what I'm hoping that we can all be able to do after this webinar. Appreciate that actually it is possible to evaluate the outcomes of training by methods that are globally recognized. Understand the ROI methods that are also globally recognized. And this is by professional trainers, business management and accountants. And my world mission is to make sure that environmental managers can do it too. We'll actually look at a simple method to measure costs and benefits. And at the end, I'd love you guys to tell me how well the webinar lined up with what you wanted from attending. Now, as I come and do this, we've got more people coming in. This is terrific. <laughs> so we just see if that enables me to change. So how are we going to do all this today? Here's a bit of a roadmap. We're going to look at the context, which is sustainable procurement at government level. We're going to define the terms. What do we mean by ROI, by training, by broader outcomes, which is what the government's talking about. We're going to do some calcs, how to actually run the numbers on costs to avoid measure the gains we make. We're going to look at how trainers um, evaluate, whoops, <laughs> this is very soggy, um, the results of their outcomes. And of course, what we're getting to is sustainability. So we'll track these as we go through the presentation. For those of you who don't know me, a little bit about me, about in the 1990s, I was lucky enough to be involved with a highly successful environmental training program. It wasn't mine. I was just part of delivering the training and helping run the program. It was erosion and sediment control on big construction sites. Now we burgled that from the States, but it was so successful that it spread all around the country and to Australia. But it was, we were also surprised at how extraordinarily well it worked. And so I wrote a book about the success because I figured that the knowledge would be lost. So now the second edition of that book, which I have to say is miles better, came out at the end of last year. And also at the end of last year, I set up the Environment and Sustainability Strategic Training Institute so that I can pass on all my IP. This is my big mission. Okay, back to the wider context of sustainable procurement. In 2010, the government put out, the New Zealand government put out these um, four guides. These are still live and there is a lot of huge information in them. Now, after this webinar, I will also email to you a Word document with live links to all of these documents that I reference. 
So in um, late last year, the New Zealand government actually created, uh, here we are, I've jumped to Australia. The New Zealand government brought out rules and these now complement the 2010 guidelines. And these are rules around sustainable procurement for government entities. And they've got a lot to say about what people should be doing about training. Now, we've got a couple of Australians on the call here. Welcome, Melanie. Welcome, Jason. And we've got the same situation across the ditch where the federal government has a sustainable procurement guide. All of the different states have got sustainable procurement as well. And you can see this one from Victoria, again, with a construction focus because construction is just such a big industry. So it doesn't matter if you work on one side of the ditch or the other or you work across the ditch our governments are making rules and requirements around sustainable procurement. Now, late last year, the New Zealand government put out its priorities for what would be its wellbeing budget in May this year. And actually, well, you know, defining what is a wellbeing budget, a wellbeing budget counts more than GDP. It's not just like columns and columns and pages and pages of accounts. It actually includes people and the environment in its accounting packages. And so it makes those outcomes very, very explicit instead of just having things as a line item. Now, Kate Rayworth, the donut economist, who many of you will know, a bunch of us went to see her last year when international travel was possible and free. And she spoke at the Writers' Festival about donut economics. And she came here specifically to have a look at the wellbeing budget. So it's quite a big deal. But of course we know what happened next. We got the pandemic. So the government's budget in May was basically about the rebuild and trying to build back better. And so we've seen all these amazing fiscal stimuli come through the Jobs for Nature, the Free Trades Training and the Shovel Ready projects. And actually James Parry, he and I were conversing before a few days ago when he registered for this webinar, he made the most amazing quote. James, thank you for allowing me to use it. He reckons that trained and well-mentored interns with generic and technical skills may be the most lasting and essential output from Shovel Ready Projects. Kia ora, James. Really, I think that's incredible and I'm astounded that I as a trainer never thought of that. So thank you, <laughs> it's really great. Now look, I've got a particular and narrow definition of what training is. So for me, obviously, it's in the field of environment and sustainability, and it, I describe it as the acquisition of work-related knowledge, skills, and practices that will improve a specified aspect of on-the-job performance in ways that are objectively observable. So an onlooker can see what is being done, and there is some kind of benchmark or guidance against which they can evaluate how, whether it's working or not. So what exactly is ROI? return on investment. It measures in monetary terms whether our training generates a net positive benefit to the organization. And it answers the question, is our training worth it? So training asks, what do our people need to know in order to do their job brilliantly well? ROI says, did the training deliver that? So the two of them really go together. So I'm going to see if we can use the chat box. I've actually got uh, three screens in front of me. So I can, I can see the chat. Tell us your thoughts about this. Why do you live, deliver your training? What sorts of returns do you want? And perhaps some of you, if you're more interested in the costs, what costs do you normally put in your training budget? And I'd love to know from each of you, have you measured the financial ROI of your training? And a simple Y or N will let me know. So take a moment to reflect on the training you've done. What returns do you want? What costs does it take? to achieve them. And that's a bit of time for people to think about the massive information dump that I've just done. Barry Singleton, it's all new to me, getting an idea. We're going to have to, Gavin, can you come in? Oh, hold on, I think I can do this. Move the chat box a bit over. Mm -hmm. 
magic getting an idea of what we might do that's absolutely fabulous barry i love it um now someone has also suggested increase environmental culture on site to make my job easier this is an environmental manager clearly um any other returns or outcomes that you want from your training uh, here we go um james Enhance industry capability, national utility of our population, products of internships, guided learning coaching correction, wages plus your time. No RI too busy with one and two. Yeah, ain't that how it works, huh? That is definitely what happens. We just get so, so busy. Yeah, we do. So um, this is something, and I think actually that in the lead up to these shovel ready and regional development projects coming on board, we have got to build our capacity now to do this or we will just be clobbered. In fact, a client of mine is also thinking about um, how can they, they're setting up new systems internally to be able to cope with the counting, James. These are great answers. Um, oh, how many of you have measured the financial ROI of training? Um, can I take that as a resounding no? Uh, that's very common. Um, in fact, um, can I break you a big secret from the world of professional training? We'll look later on at how much, how they evaluate their training. Very few of them end up doing financial ROI. This is something where we can do miles better than the training experts, really miles better, because we're not frightened of numbers. As environmental managers, we are used to the numbers. Okay, so essentially what ROI will do is it helps you build the business case for your training to justify getting that budget now so that we can hit the ground running in the future. And so some of the things that training will do for you, higher staff engagement, retention and productivity, greater understanding of how your business works, you know, because you're down there at the coalface with people and looking at the communication between all the different levels of the operation. And I think better bidding for government and private projects. And these things can be monetized and they can add really quite astonishing um, levels to the bottom line. One company where I read about a case study in Australia, Canon, they um, identified that staff turnover was a big problem. They only had a thousand staff. They spent 30 grand on a buddy system for, for new interns. And in the first year, uh, they saved $4 million in staff turnover and recruitment costs and training. So this is the sort of thing that understanding ROI can do for you. Now let's have a little look at some of the costs that we really do need to avoid. And this is the story of a big spill. So it happened on a Friday night, of course, because that's when they happened. The only good thing was it wasn't raining. So it was a contractor doing some road marking um, and the um, a machine that had the paint, cubic meter of paint on the back of it, the brakes failed and there wasn't a curb and this thing ran down the hill into a stream and a cubic meter of paint went through the stream. So at that time it was thought that the stream was up above the town water supply intake of a small town. It turned out not to be, but that made no difference to the quality of the response of these people. They rang everybody at work, they rang the council, they rang the fire brigade, they rang the sucker trucks, the solid waste disposals, they got in there and it took them all night. And they cleaned up the spill and they did the most amazing job. Now the environment manager had actually seen some of the work I'd been doing on ROI, so she called me in and we did the analysis. And so we broke down the categories of how much did the spill cost into three groups, the immediate response cost, then the follow-up cost of investigating, learning, remedy, and then the opportunity costs. Now, there are lots and lots of costs we can consider, but um, opportunity costs are just one example of these. So, um, this is not to compete with your existing incident and near miss or your risk reporting software and systems but hopefully it will help you extract more and more information out of them. So here's the first table. What I will be doing actually is I will be um, sending you these tables as Excel spreadsheets um, so that you can start using them and see how they work. Um, and so this is table one, the upfront cash costs. 
And so the main headings in that um, table, which might be too small for some of you to read, are things like staff time, materials and supplies, time charged by external parties, plant and equipment hire, loss of or damage to plant equipment and supplies. So we added up people's time and we added up all the expenses. So then we moved on to a second table, table two, which should be putting in an appearance any minute now, um, which is the costs afterwards. So you know what they say, the only really bad mistake is the one you don't learn from. So they invested a huge amount of time in actually trying to work out what had happened and what needed to be done. And so the sorts of things that they'd be looking up there is all your meetings, you're looking at software, cost of product lost, development of new procedures, staff training, maybe modifications to equipment, all of that sort of stuff. And actually documenting the learnings and doing something about it. And actually to me, it's that documenting of the learnings which is so extraordinarily important and people often don't have time to do it. So the third table, the opportunity costs, is um, some of the headings I've got in there are, well, the question it's asking here is, all the people involved, what else should they have been doing? You know, that they ended up doing all the cleanup, doing all the learning, doing the, all the rest of it. What actual work should they have been doing? So that night, that part of the road did not get painted. So that's the kind of opportunity cost we're looking at. Um, looking at your training manager and all the rest of it, they could have been busy on another project, but they need to help on this one. So what we then did was that we started adding up all of these costs. So that's tables one, two, and three. And we added up the grand total, which I don't know how much you guys have got in mind, um, whether you've got a number that you could think of, but the actual cost to, oops, I don't know what's happening here. The thick end of 154, we good Thanksgiving, so. Thick end of our, oh, $155,000. Okay, it was a big spill, no doubt about it. But actually what happened was at the last workshop I ran, um, one of the people attending it, we worked through this case study and most people had brought along a reasonably large incident, but we don't get large incidents all the time, thank goodness. So she worked on one that had happened literally the day before on a work site, construction site she was working on. And there's someone had spilled a cubic meter of concrete and she thought, ah, okay, I'll have a look at how much it costs to clean that up. Now, I don't know how many numbers you guys have got going through your heads, you know, where it's only one digit, got a zero, got another zero. It turned out to be $1,000, $10,000, I'm so sorry, 10 grand to clean up one cube of concrete. So that spill of paint into the river, that was a doozy, you know, that was quite a biggie. But how many stray cubes of concrete do you think end up all over construction sites, all over the country, all the time? This is partly why the construction sector has got such a low productivity. We're all running around fixing up mistakes. So, um, you know, these things add up. Doesn't matter if they're big or small, they really, really add up. So questions for you to contemplate, and I will be sending a copy of these PowerPoints out to everyone afterwards. How many of these cost categories do you normally count and how much value do you think it would add to your business if you did start counting them? What interests me is how much training could you do for $150,000 or 155000 really because it added up to such a big amount. So actually also on the last workshop I ran, um, one guy said, oh, could I do um, a health and safety example because I'd ask them all to bring along case studies. And I said, well, look, I don't know anything about health and safety, but if you do, why don't we do the experiment and see whether the system works for that? So he did. And um, what had happened was he worked for um, a quite a large nonprofit um, as an advisor. He wasn't paid at all. He was, it was something he did as a volunteer. And they consistently refused to accept some really quite important health and safety advice. And in the end, he and a colleague actually resigned from their work with this organization because the liability was simply too high for them. Um, and so they left and they reckon that that organization lost about $400,000 worth of knowledge and incurred expenses as well for replacing that knowledge. So it was quite a biggie. 
Another one, I was doing training on solid um, waste minimization and resource efficiency in a canning factory. And these people actually um, ended up, well, basically what happened was their biggest expense was of course tin plate, but the tin plate would keep jamming in all of the different lines they had for making all the different sized tins. So um, they, on my advice, they engaged a polytech student from the local polytech to have a look at it. It turned out after he looked at all the sources of damage to the tin plate, it was actually poor quality control at their HQ in Australia, shipping them bent tin plate. So they saved themselves, you know, the thick end of half a million dollars a year, every year as an ongoing business saving. This stuff's incredibly important if you're running a business. It's incredibly important, but we don't count the numbers. So this brings us to the four formulae that are used all around the world by people in business and training. So the measures are net gain, ROI, benefit cost ratio, and payback period. So net gain is um, pretty simple. The total benefit minus the to total cost, that's the net gain. Then what you do with ROI is you multiply that by 100%. Um, you do that, follow that formula. That gives you a dimensionless number and it tells you the percentage change. So for example, and this is an example from a trainer called Derek Good, if we invest $2,000, that's our cost, and we measure um, $2,000 investment and 12 grand's worth of benefits, if you do that analysis, the ROI, the mathematical geniuses among you, but certainly not me, will be able to work out the ROI is 500%. So benefit cost ratio, another way of interpreting the numbers, um, this tells you the dollar return for every dollar invested. So you can see you're just kind of taking different points of view about the financial benefit to the company of these improvements. So again, for our 12 grand's worth of benefits and two grand in costs, the ratio is six to one. So that means for every dollar you invested, you recouped six. So, I mean, this stuff I think is quite, it's quite a useful way of doing it. Now, another thing that's often used in business circles is the payback period. So that's when you bring in the time dimension. Um, and so, you know, the payback period, I actually forgot to do the calc ahead of time. Um, doubtless some of you can do it and if any of you can follow that formula, if you could chuck it in the chat, that's absolutely fine. But um, yeah, it, it, that tells us how long it takes for the improvement to pay for itself. Now, back when I was doing that um, waste, minimiza waste minimization resource efficiency work um, with that company, most firms at that time, it was quite a long time ago, had a two year cutoff for payback. You know, but if you're doing something like looking at changing from a coal to a gas boiler or gas to electricity or coal direct to electricity, you know, that it, it, two years, it won't pay back. But, you know, we've got to be making such big changes so fast for climate change, water quality, human health and well-being. We need to have much longer payback periods in our business. And if you look at many Maori businesses, for example, they'll have a business planning horizon of 100, 300, 500 years. We should all be doing that. That is how we're going to really heal this planet and all the people on it. So what does training do for your business? Well, three things ROI will tell you. The true cost of the small stuff we get wrong every day, like those cubes of concrete, you know, littering the country up and down. It will help us work out what is the actual real full cost of the occasional biggie. And it will also tell us the huge returns that our training delivers. Now the catch here is if we measure them which means we need to start thinking about these things right up front and right from the start. So let's take a quick look at who says what returns we could measure. So first up, of course, is our company. Every company's got its vision, mission um, statement, it's got its KPIs, it's got its big goals, sustainability, all the rest of it. You know, so. Those are the sorts of returns that your business should be measuring to work out its own progress towards its own goals. 
the communities, the places where we live and work, most communities have got development plans that are going to improve um, how it is for their people to live and work there. Um, our clients, so at the moment, it'll be the government clients, but in fact, it'll trickle into the private sector pretty quick. And I think we can get a backwards flow from the contractors through the consultants up to the private clients. And lots of private clients will be wanting to do this stuff. They want to build back better from COVID. So some clients will specifically request particular outcomes. Others might ask you to identify them. So we're going to look. Well, we'll look at that too. Now, the construction sector accord, that um, image there is from that. It's got some really fabulous goals about the reputation of the sector, about agility, about sustainability. Absolutely terrific. There's a lot of good information in there that we could actually start measuring. I've gone right to the end. Oh, no, here we go. Sorry. Everyone, I just hit the um, blank button and gave myself a terrible fright. Okay, so the other thing we've got is our government's goals in the wellbeing budget. So these goals are for everyone in Aotearoa New Zealand, and it's doing that through its procurement policies, and it's got a living standards framework, and Treasury and Stats New Zealand have actually got a wellbeing dashboard and a bunch of indicators as well. And these are clues. These are clues for the broader outcomes that we could be looking at. Right, I think we've got a nice big file in here. So who else is saying what returns we could measure? This is coming to the government's new procurement rules, especially rule 16 about broader outcomes and rule 18, the construction skills and training. So what's the definition of broader outcomes? Actually in the rule, it says that these are secondary benefits generated by our goods, services or works. And they fall into the categories of social, environmental, cultural and economic. And they're defined as being able to deliver long-term value for the public of New Zealand. Now, I don't like that term secondary. I think these, if you think from, from the very beginning of a project, you can have a lot of significant co-benefits or additional benefits for little or no marginal cost if you just think about it from the start. So I actually think that term broader outcomes is a good one. Um, for the Aussies amongst us, um, when we say cultural here, we mean Indigenous. So the Indigenous capital is now starting to be measured by some of the bigger international accounting companies in Australia. In New Zealand, we've had Māori looking at this stuff for a very long time, and they've got some exceptionally useful tools for environmental cultural monitoring. So what we need to do is we need to align our projects or interpret what we deliver from them using the government's four capitals. So Treasury calls these indicators of future well-being. So that's natural capital, which is everything in the environment, social capital, human capital, and financial and physical capital. So we can use those categories ourselves to identify what categories of other benefits we could um, deliver. So this year's, um, this is the second, um, Teletrack Navman and Civil Contractors New Zealand construction industry survey and they had some really interesting stuff again I'll send you the link to this document about sustainability I found it quite fascinating so what they're um, saying 75% of contractors workers for public agencies who will be using these procurement rules 77% are doing something to be more environmentally sustainable 37% had clients say we will be choosing our providers on the basis of these sustainability practices. So you have to be not only walking the talk, but you have to be able to document it. So the top five issues with the most impact in the next three years, nearly 60% saw the focus on training and other social outcomes as positive. 42 saw waste minimization and high landfill levies as a negative impact on them. 25% saw it as a positive impact. Same with the Zero Carbon Act. Half thought it would be negative, 18% or a positive impact. You can tell who the forward thinking and forward looking companies are from that, aren't you? This is right back to Michael Paul today's competitive advantage. The companies that see environment as a source of competitive advantage are the ones who are going to be grabbing this work. 
So in the government's new 2019 sustainable procurement guide, it talks about four broader outcomes. I'm just focusing on two, workforce capacity and capability and net zero emissions economy and significant solid waste reduction. So I'm color coding these according to the four capitals and I put net zero um, as an environmental one and significant waste reduction as an economic one because you save bucket loads of money. Why pay the landfill operator um, if you can reduce that waste? And so these are some of the things that the government will actually start to look at. And I'll let you read them while I catch up with where I am in my PowerPoints. And again, I've color coded them. So it's value for money over whole of life. We're going to have to start getting a whole lot more sophisticated about how we assess our environmental and our economic performance. So again, as businesses, we need to be growing our own capability to do this. So um, in various surveys, companies often say, well, look, actually, we don't really know what sustainability means. We've got no idea what things we should be looking at or trying to change. We don't know what environment means. We don't know the difference. And so the government has conveniently listed them for us. So it lists things like climate change, ozone depletion, you know, optimizing the use of natural resources, getting away from this just extractive, you know, trash and leave kind of mentality, minimizing the use of hazardous substances. That's great for human and environmental health, as well as um, the environment. Waste minimization, creating jobs, health and safety. These are all listed in the government's procurement guide. So other things there are equality, fair play, fair pay for supply staff, economic regeneration, you know, bringing jobs into the regions, um, building sustainable markets, legal compliance is in there, obviously, and public image protection and enhancement, you know, part of the construction sector record is to repair the reputation of the sector as a whole, you know, help us be good corporate citizens. So these are some of the things that contractors were taking. Um, so most of them were, well, half, minimizing waste, a sizable chunk looking at um, carbon, actually. Um, quite a few looking at what's going on in their offices. Some of them starting to work with their supply chains. I found that really interesting. Water efficiency, obviously in Auckland, they weren't allowed to use water from the mains during the drought. That was, uh, civil contractors, uh, James Corlett, they did a huge amount of work over that time. And including environmentally friendly aspects and projects, solar power, stormwater plantings, plantings for pollinators, bees, bats, moths. You know, you're going to plant plants. Why don't you plant some that actually, you know, repair our um, suffering um, biodiversity and energy efficiency, future planning, which is a very good thing. So here's, that's rule 16. And it, it gives us a lot of tips, as you can see. Here's rule 18 skills and training and really this comes back to what in fact I heard Alan Bollard on the radio this morning talking about um, the massive need for skills injection and strategic management of skills training he's he's the CEO of the infrastructure commission and so I'm going to go right back and listen to the whole of that interview and download it I'll send you the link in what I sent because he's saying exactly what I've said what I'm saying here um, so it's really um People calling for government projects will be asking you, what are you doing to grow skills and employment opportunities? Māori Pacifica women, how are you going to recruit, retain and train your staff? And James Pari, I saw your thing on um, in response to Paul Evans's comment on LinkedIn, it's totally on the money. So recruitment, training, keeping our people, you know, we really do have to look after them. So we are in a situation where we've got the most humongous local and global skills shortage. So as an example, one large council spent 153 grand just to fit, fit, um, fix up one set of bested stormwater ponds because the people didn't have the skills to design them properly and the people didn't have the skills to build them properly. So the poor old council inherits these impaired assets and has to spend a whole bunch of money to bring them up to scratch. And they were saying that example is just the tip of the iceberg. So this magnificent fellow is Baron von Munchausen. 
Our borders are closed. Yes, we're having some skilled New Zealanders, including engineers, coming back into the country. But the, the skills shortage is global. We are going to have to grow our own. So if we want to be doing this work and contributing to the broader outcomes of shovel-ready projects and all the regional development, we are going to have to learn how to grow these skills ourselves. We're going to have to do what Baron did and lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. So um, this is a wonderful quote from Brendan Maloney, who is a professional trainer. And he said in 2012, trainers with environmental skills are going to be in huge demand. And so it means that even though the industry is hurting right now and we still don't have enough work coming in, last year's CCNZ and Teletrack Navman survey showed that 50% of civil construction training is done in-house. So some of that will be professional development for people with university degrees, and a lot of it will be vocational training for your hands-on staff. But the people delivering this training are going to need a huge amount of support so that they can upskill everybody, the whole organisation is gonna to have to learn how to do this and why not? <laughs> it's very exciting. So how do you line up your training outcomes with these broader outcomes that we've been talking about? So here's what professional trainers do um, if they're going to measure their training outcomes. So reaction is level one and that's the little sheet they give you at the end of the day and usually people write things like, well, um, the room was too hot and the food was too cold. You know, but you can set it up that you get really useful information. This is what professional trainers do. Learning. How much did they know before they came? How much did they know by the time they left? What are you going to do to evaluate the learning of people who can't read and write or whose English is not very good? All of these are things that I've had to grapple with in some of my clients' companies. Practice. So what are they actually doing differently at work and who's going to notice that you know so you have to train the supervisors before you train the people because it's the supervisors who will document the improvements in practice and they're the ones who will also um, be correcting the mentoring learning for them now level four results this is what professional trainers call business impact what kind of a difference did it make to the business are you winning more tenders you know, this is the thing, are your non-price attributes going up and up and up? Are you retaining more of your staff? Do you have less rework? These are the kinds of things that you will be measuring when it comes to the results. So ROI, which is the whole topic of this particular talk, <laughs> it's just the sums. It's just the sums that I showed you before. But unless you're measuring all of these other levels one to four, you're not going to have any information to do those sums on. So this is a big thing that um, we need to look at as a profession. The other thing we can do is align these outcomes with government indicators, and that's just as true in Australia as it is in New Zealand. So without line them up against natural, social, human, physical, and financial capital. And so, in fact, we've got 12 wellbeing domains across those capitals. And there are indicators for all of them. And I'll be sending you the links to all of this. So you, these are some of the social outcomes that you can document when you're looking at your bids. Okay, are we going for time? I think we're doing all right. Now, this is a really scary thing, running the numbers. What sort of returns can we look for? Well, you know, in New Zealand society, and astonishingly enough, this is true all around the world, most of us are functionally illiterate. So we need level three out of five levels of literacy um, to cope with a complicated society. So 43% of adults in Aotearoa between the age of 16 and 65 function at level two literacy. That's below the level of literacy needed in day-to-day -day life. Now, you know, I've, I was working with a client of mine because if you're looking at this diagram of how to construct a sediment retention pond shown in the photograph there, you have to be not only literate but also numerate and you have to have a very good grasp of English in order to be able to follow the plans. These things are very specifically sized. You get that wrong, it's horrendously expensive and it takes weeks sometimes to build these things. And so one of my clients was saying, yes, we're going to roll out the training and what they were doing was fantastic. And I said, okay, good, love it. 
how many of your trainees don't have English as a first language and how many of them struggle with literacy. So I sent them some links to people where they could go and get that training done. And some months later, I was at a meeting of the New Zealand Association of Training and Development. Lo and behold, a case study came up of my very own company, that company, and they gave literacy training to everybody there. And this man stood up in the video about the literacy training and he said, I mean, obviously he's going to build his sediment ponds better and all the rest of it at work. But what he said was, for the first time, I can now help my children with their homework. It's like the whole room full of trainers was crying their eyes out, you know, at this. This is intergenerational benefit. This is absolutely extraordinary. And it sounds a terrible thing to say, but we can put a dollar value on that. But really, wouldn't you say that was priceless? It's absolutely incredible what we do. So look, what we've done so far is we've looked at counting the costs of spills. And I've given you a hint of the vast literature out there on some of the amazing benefits and savings um, that you can have with better staff training, better staff retention. So what we looked at with that spill was the immediate response costs, the cost of investigating, learning and acting, and the opportunity costs of the people who should have been doing good work that got all tied up in unpacking that. However, that is a good investment of time to clean up and do the learning. So what I've not covered in this, um, well, you'd have to call it a whistle stop tour, wouldn't you? Communication, contractual, legal and PR costs. Now that $154,000 that it cost that spill, that was no lawyers. Imagine if the lawyers had got involved. Imagine if you had lawyers wrangling with the council. Imagine if you got taken to court. And for those of you who've had the time to read that booklet that I sent you, Prosecutable to Profitable, you know, one company actually went out of business because it misread those signals from the courts. And, you know, th this is absolutely enormous. And the, the whole reputational thing, and we've seen a lot of construction firms get not very good press. And it's horrible. It's horrible for the sector. It's horrible for those companies. It's just awful for the staff involved. It just doesn't do anybody any good. And ultimately, you know, the costs of getting it wrong have a huge impact on business valuation and viability. And believe me, the financial sector are looking at all of us. So one um, time when I was talking about the actual legal arrangements around erosion, set of control and some of the prosecutions, one guy said he was such a nice man. He said that he got, um, oh, what did he get? He just got an abatement notice, which is, you know, not much at all. And he said, um, he didn't think much of it, um, but some months later, they fixed everything up, obviously, and all the rest of it. Some months later, his professional indemnity and public insurance, uh, public liability insurance came up for renewal. And he said, it went up enormously. So the insurance firm had obviously been watching all of this and uh, decided that he wasn't um, a particularly good risk. So they upped the premium. You know, these things have got real, real results. There's no doubt about it. So yeah, that's um, those that case study is actually in that ebook that I sent you on registration. I think we had one late person join, and so I will make sure that you get a copy of that as well. So if you want to be able to do more, here's the advertisement, and I'll be quick. In about three weeks' time, Wednesday the 11th, I will run a one-day workshop. I've run this before, and. Um, you can find out more about the workshop at that link, which will go out in your PowerPoints, but I'll also send you a link to it. And actually, it's, it's one of my most favourite workshops. I just adore running this workshop because people have such a great time working with the, the data from their very own businesses and just taking away, you know, information on how to make a business case for a grumpy boss. And they, they have a lot of fun. Anyway, so next thing. We've looked at ROI. You've got to use it. Thank you, Gavin. So the analyses will help you measure the results of your training. What are you getting back from the money spent? And even just starting to look at this will really open your eyes. I think it's just amazing. It will help you be accountable to your funders and to your trainees. You know, we put people through training. And actually, I saw a statistic. Um, it was a global survey, and it said something like 
60 or 70 percent of people when they were sent on workplace training found it boring, irrelevant and useless. I'm sure you don't want your training to fall into that category. And you can be accountable to the managers of the trainees and the managers say, yes, you can have an hour a day or whatever, or invest your time in getting a qualification. You know, you owe it to them to be able to demonstrate the value that they're getting. This will help you build a business case for more training budget, and it will help you learn and grow as a trainer. And the flow on results of that will be that you will be able to win more bids for government projects. And you'll be able to do that by using solid stats, real numbers, not just fluffy phrases, you know, oh, we'll be frightfully nice to our people and I'm sure we'll give lots of people some nice jobs. It's not going to cut the mustard anymore. You'll be able to now, I mean, the thing is that your projects will come to an end. You're not going to be hanging around to actually monitor those long term outcomes. But what you will be able to give your client is a set of robust indicators that are verified and consistent and used across the government. And you will be able to give them those numbers where they can evaluate the long term and emerging outcomes of the project that you built for them. You'll be able to deliver real results for the people and communities where you work. And a lot of companies are starting to do this now, is really invest in the, in the communities where we're really temporary residents, although very disruptive ones if we're talking about chucking in motorways and goodness knows what. And here is something that actually is immensely valuable, even priceless. And this is some work that Peter Senge has done which is to learn and grow as a business and become a learning organization because that is what will help you cope with uncertainty. It will help you become agile. All of the things that we need as we stay in this bizarre and uncertain future of COVID-19. And I think it would be nice for New Zealand as a whole to turn into a learning society as well. So questions or comments, you can use the chat box. Um, put in some questions that you'd like me to address. Um, if you want, and you certainly don't have to, and you're more than welcome to contact me afterwards, tell me whether this met or exceeded or missed the expectations that you'd had. And you can book me for a, you know, for a free no obligation chat. I'd be very happy just to talk you through with this because I think this is such an important time for us all. Um, we're learning so much and we're being forced to learn faster and faster so that we can build back better from COVID. So I think I do have another couple of slides. Oh no, I think that's about it. So type something in if you like, or you can send me something afterwards. We've got one more thing. I'm going to leave you with a bit of a challenge. What does this mean for you and your environmental training. So this would be your health and safety training, your quality training. So your three actions. Oh, hang on, here we go. We've got some questions. I'm going to come back. Seems the government focus is on a way from, oh, whoa, these are coming in. This is fantastic. I need to get my mouse onto the other screen. Government focus away from a linear to circular process and in so doing we need to train people to think like that. Yes, internalizing externalities. Who would have thought we'd be talking economic speak, huh? <laughs> this is a fundamental shift. And ROI absolutely needs to consider what all the co-benefits might be and not just in financial terms. So um, you've made me remember that some of the other sets of indicators um, are the global reporting index, the GRI, which about 80 odd stock exchanges now require their listed companies to put in integrated reports about everything to do with their business, environment, people, um, the lot. You know, this is incredibly important. There is a natural capital protocol which can measure and monetize natural capital. It's astonishingly, it sounds so complicated, but it's astonishingly simple at first sight. I just looked at it um, to use. Absolutely remarkable. And of course, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We, uh, we've got loads and loads of indicators. And then James to Jeff, yes, how can we, how far can we realistically lift individual and identify precisely where someone is at? So we can serve them for the next piece. You know what? 
Oh, thank you, Andy. Um, <laughs> what professional trainers talk about is lifelong learning. And there's a lovely guy called Jos Reichsman who talks about life-wide learning. You know, it's like that man who learned to read and write. Sure, he could build all his environmental controls, you know, and get them right first time. But the life-wide learning, it, it will have made an enormously positive result to the whole dynamics of his family. And so then we come into our organisational learning and I think we really do need to learn as a society. Oh, these are fabulous comments, people. I absolutely love them and I'm going to have to make sure that I keep them. So hopefully that is now on my clipboard. Dad, terrific. And I'll send those out along with everyone. Um, and now I've got to get my mouse back onto the other screen. Here we go. <laughs> this is quite amazing. <laughs> so we've got five minutes to go, team. Um, yeah, I would like to leave you with a challenge that you do something. Why not set a smart target that's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-based? So within 10 minutes of this video ending, you identify three things that you will do with respect to your training. Within one week, you would have started at least one of them. And within three weeks, you would have made some definite steps. So I sincerely hope that you are able to go and do that. So team, this is the end of our time together. I've really enjoyed it. And I really, really, really do hope that you've got something here that you can take away and start using. I'll be sending you all of those emails with plenty and plenty of stuff. Um, the PowerPoints, the spreadsheets. Yeah, I'll be sending you the links to the documents I've cited. So, you know, in sum, as I say farewell, I think it's time that we all saw the measuring the ROI of our training as a core element of our corporate accounting. I just think that's so incredibly important. For me, it's all about learning for life on earth. Ngā here, everyone. Aroha nui to you for all of the wonderful work that you're doing. Get out there and keep making the world a better place. Thank you for coming and I'll be in touch soon.